Um, so on Canvas, I uh, have everything updated. One thing I did this morning um, was it will look like there's two exam scores up there. Uh, basically, the one is just the original exam that you took, so it has all of your individual answers in there. The other one I upload, uploaded just reflects the exact same score, but it kind of grades it and shows you the percentage out of 100, right? So the other one, it has 105 because there were some bonus points that were available. So the new one will kind of just give you your grade out of 100 and then use that. But you can still see the original kind of scores and everything you had on each problem looking at that original exam, uh, what looks like as an original exam assignment. Okay. Uh, other than that, the connect homeworks up there after today, we'll have, you know, more to be able to more information. You can start working through more of those problems on Wednesday. I'll get up the next Excel assignment. So you'll have, uh, you know, everything you need after Wednesday to start working through that Excel assignment as well. Okay. If there's no questions for me, let's kind of get jumping into here. Make sure the chat pulls up over here. Double check that it's recording. All right, we're good. Okay. So, oops, I got a question coming in. So, um, email me, and I can't remember the exact protocol. I think the university will let you know if you're supposed to be uh, quarantined. But uh, shoot me an email after class. Okay. So we'll jump into things here. Um, we, we left off last class talking about the normal distribution. We said, you know, these variables that are normally distributed are defined by two things, the mean and the variance, right? So the mean kind of shifted it along the x-axis. The variance kind of either if it was a really high variance, it flattened the curve, very low variance kind of made it more peaked. But that what we really wanted was to be able to use that table, that standard normal distribution or that z table so we wanna be working with a, a normal variable that has a mean zero variance of one, okay? So we talked about, we can take that normal variable X, convert it into Z scores, and then we know these Z scores are gonna be standard normally distributed, okay? So here was our equation for getting the Z score. If X was above the mean, we should end up with a positive Z score. If X is below the mean, we should end up with a negative Z score. So the sign tells us whether or not the value we're looking at is above or below the mean, okay? It represents, the z-score itself represents the number of standard deviations away from the mean that you are. So if it's positive, you were that many standard deviations above the mean. If it's negative, that x value was that many standard deviations below the mean. We also said the mean will always have a z-score of zero. And once we convert that value we're interested in x into a z-score, well, now we can use the standard normal distribution or we can use those tables. So we'll work through a few examples and see how this is done today. Okay, so what happens if we start out with that original variable that's not standard normally distributed? So maybe I'm interested in, okay, this variable X is normally distributed, but maybe it has a mean of 50 variance of, I don't know, 30. What's the probability I see that variable take on a value between 40 and 60, right? So 40 and 60, that's kind of the general setup. Well, the first thing we're gonna wanna do is convert these values for X that we're interested in into Z scores. Once we have z-scores, we know we can use that standard normal distribution. So how do we do that? We basically just use this equation. The cutoff score for x we're interested in here is a, so turn that into a z-score. Cutoff value we're interested in here is b, turn that into a z-score. We're then gonna draw this out, kind of the region that we're looking for. Then using these z-scores, we're gonna find probabilities from that z-table or standard normal distribution table. And then the fourth and final step we'll see here today, um, at first, sometimes we don't have to do anything here, sometimes we do, but it's using these probabilities to look up whatever we originally wanted. So for kind of this example, we think about this visually, what we're looking at here is, I've got some variable X, right? I know it's normally distributed. It's got some value for the mean, and I wanna find the probability it's in between A and B. If I turn those into Z scores, what I could do is look up this Z score. It would give me this area. Look up this Z score on the table. It gives me that area. So the fourth and final step would be to subtract the smaller area from the larger area, and then I'd be left with what's, uh, just what's in between, right? 
So kind of that subtraction of the two probabilities is what that last step is representing. So I'll put some actual values to this now. So let me make sure I got that person. There we go. So let's say I have this normally distributed variable that has a mean of five and a variance of 25. Okay. What's the probability that I see this variable take on a value in between 10 and 15? So first, the way I would always start these out is just draw out what you're looking for, okay? So we're gonna start here, we're just gonna draw out what we're looking for, the original variable x, okay? So we have this variable x, normally distributed, mean of five, all right? Just kind of a reminder, the mean was five. We had a variance of 25, which means the standard deviation is just the square root of that, square root of five, sorry, square root of 25 is five, okay? We wanna find the probability that this X variable is in between 10 and 15, okay? So what we're first gonna do is then think about, okay, I need to transform that value of 10 into a z-score. How can I do that? Well, I'll use that formula I have for my z-score, which is take the value I'm interested in, 10, subtract the mean, five, divide by my standard deviation. Right. So if I do that, this should give me a z-score of one, right. which represents the value of 10 was one standard deviation away from the mean. Now I could use this formula for the value of 15 to find that z-score, right? And I wanted the area in between. But if I think about this one, I've got nice numbers and this time I can reiterate what the z-score means. If I look at 15, how far away is it from the mean? Well, if the mean is five, 15 is just 10 away from the mean. If the standard deviation is five, being 10 away from the mean means I'm two standard deviations away from the mean. Which sure enough, if I plug 15 into my z-score equation, it'll return to me too, right? And it should, because here it's very intuitive with these nice easy numbers to see 15 was two standard deviations away from the mean. What I then do next is say, well, I know I want the area in between, but all I can find from the table is the area to the left of these z-scores. So I can find the area to the left of one by looking up one in my table. I can find the area to the left of two by looking up two in my z table. I then subtract that smaller area from the larger area and all I'm left with is what's in between those two z scores, okay? So how would I do that? So I first convert these two values into z scores. So 10 and 15 becomes z scores of one and two. I can then look these up in the table, which I look up a z-score of one, so we scroll down here, 1.00, that's a z-score of one, 0.8413. So the area to the left of that z-score of zero, excuse me, is 0.8413. I look up that z-score of two, 2 2.00. The area to the left of two is 0.9772. So I looked up that first area, so kind of this red bricked area. That was the area to the left of one. We found that on the table was 0.84 and three. This kind of entire shaded light blue area, you kind of know underneath the brick is also shaded blue because it was the area to the left of a z-score of two. That area was 0.9772. So if I subtract kind of this bricked area from the larger blue area, all I'm left with is what's in between, which is what I originally wanted, okay? So just subtract the smaller from the larger one and I'm, I've got the probability that I want. Now we'll do a few more examples that I think are actually a little bit easier than this, um, just with some more difficult numbers, okay? And they kind of give us a, an actual practical kind of application, okay? So I have this huge data set, we'll eventually look at it today in Excel, of Indiana weather dating back to like 1895. So if we look at rainfall, what ends up being true is it follows pretty close to a normal distribution. So I can find in my data set, if I have the average rainfall each year, I can find the mean and the variance pretty easy in Excel, right? So I did that and I know it follows a normal distribution. I also can look at, so rainfall kind of 
annually, follows its normal distribution, and we have the mean and we have the variance. I can also find individual months rainfall, since I have that in my data set, and I could kind of treat that the same way, right? Find the, the mean, the variance, I know it's normally distributed, and now we can start to answer some pretty, some kind of interesting questions, since, uh, you know, I think they're interesting. I think hopefully you, you understand the kind of practicality of them once we're done. So I just did a histogram real quick of average monthly rainfall, and you kind of notice it follows very, looks very close to a normal distribution, right? Um, so we can treat it as normal. So kind of the setup for this first problem is in 2020, or 2020, 2012, there was a big drought kind of in the summer, right? And so if we looked at kind of average rainfall that year, it was very, very low, right? You kind of see some of these areas had like less, you had zero kind of rainfall in June. If we look at the time series, it's kind of something to support that. It's kind of interesting. If we notice, every time we look at the months of February and June, there's kind of this usually an increase in the average rainfall we see. February to June, increase in rainfall. February to June, increase. When we get to 2012, no increase. In fact, it just remains very, very low. Okay. So how unlikely was it, given that the average over these time periods looks like sometimes it's as high as like seven inches, What's the probability in 2012 we saw it be down here at like two inches, right? So if we looked at monthly rainfall over the entire year for 2012, we see that it was about an inch and a third, you know, 1.3 inches. So we find what average monthly rainfall was over every single year we have in the data set. It was 3.4 is the mean. And the variance was 2.57. So if we know that monthly rainfall is normally distributed, What's the probability that we saw monthly rainfall be less than 1.3 inches, given that it's normally distributed with this mean, this variance? Okay. Well, once again, where do we start? I always start kind of drawing things out, just to kind of make, make prevent us from making some easy mistakes. So what we have is this variable x, which denotes monthly rainfall. The average was 3.4 inches. My variance was 2.5, I think it was seven, okay? So I've got my average or my mean. I've got my variance. And I said, what's the probability? I saw 1.3 inches or lower in 2012. Well, right away, I know this probability has to be less than 0.5 because the area to the left and the right of the mean is 0.5. I'm looking for an area smaller, Right away, I know it has to be less than 0.5. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert 1.3 into a z-score. Okay. How do I do that? Well, I take that value of 1.3. I subtract the mean, and I divide by the standard deviation. Well, I have the variance, so all I have to do is take the square root of that variance, and that would be my standard deviation. I can do this ahead of time, or I can just kind of plug it into the formula right there. If I do this, I think the value you get is negative 1.31, which is interesting that it just ends up being close to what the actual value was, but we'll see in the other examples that's usually not the case. So I get a z value of negative 1.31. I want the area to the left of it, well, I can find that using my standard normal table. So we'll go to that table, look up negative 1.31, negative 1.31, 0.0951 is the probability I see that z-score or anything below it. So 0 0.09, is it 51 or 31? I forgot already, but whatever we had looked up in that, in that table just now. Uh, 0.0951, okay. So, so 0.0951. Now here, the final step, we said sometimes we have to do some transformation, but with the probabilities from the table, but here the problem we got from the table is exactly what we wanted. So there's really like no final step here, right? Because we already have the probability we want, we don't have to do anything, okay? All right, we'll work through another example. It's pretty similar to that just with some different values. So and kind of everything I did on the board, 
I kind of have here in this slide as well, okay? Find that z-score, look it up, we found the probability, no transformation was needed, we're done, okay? Well, I had uh, this other example. So I knew it like didn't rain a lot this September, uh, but when I looked up the actual amount, it was even lower last September. Um, so I thought it'd be kind of an interesting example. So last year, 2019, the amount of rainfall we actually got last September was 0.47 inches. The average overall, the time periods we have is 3.25 in September with a variance of 2.37. So I can find the probability that we saw less than essentially half an inch of rain last September or the probability we saw 0.47 or anything below it. And you can imagine like for, I don't know, you know, depending on what you do, but specifically farmers, right? There might be a threshold of rain they need, otherwise they're not gonna get the crop yield that they, they want. Um, and so they might want to know, well, if the probability that I see less than a half inch of rain, if that's below the threshold I need, if that probability is high, I need to start to plan for that, right? Now, if the prob probability is relatively low, it's, I'm probably not as concerned. Um, but you can imagine that applies not to just like crop yields of farmers, but any product really that would be related to rainfall. You, you know, if I'm thinking about maybe umbrella sales or something, uh, I could think about applying that, you know, this to those, those examples as well. So here, it's the exact same setup we had before. We've got this cutoff, we want the probability we see less than that. We know the mean, we know the variance, right? So everything's gonna be very, very similar to what we did before. It's just that now, I think my variance was 2.37. The value I'm interested in the cutoff is 0.47. And I think the mean we had was 3.25, okay? And this isn't 47, this is a 0.47. So what do we wanna do? We want to convert this 0.47 into a z-score and find the area to the left of it. So if I convert this into a z-score, I take that value, that cutoff for x of 0.47, subtract the mean, divide by standard deviation. I believe, this is in the slides, but I think it's negative 1.81 is that z-score that we get. All right. I then look up that z-score of negative 1.81, whatever the table tells me, that's exactly what I wanted, so then I'm done, All right? So, oops, and sorry for the, on the video that I had that pulled up the whole time. Um, so here's our z-score, we're looking up that z-score to find the area that we want. We'll go to the table. Negative 1.81, so the 0.1 column is right here. Go down to negative 1.81, 0 0.0351, okay? So this area here, 0 0.0351. Okay? So essentially what we can say is the probability that we saw as little rain as we did last September or anything, any lower amount, is really only a 3.5% chance. Right? So maybe if I'm a farmer, I look at that and if that's my you know, threshold, as long as I get a half inch of rain, I'm okay. I'm not overly concerned, right? Because the likelihood that I actually saw what I did last September is only about a 3.5% chance, okay? Um, any questions on, on this before we kind of keep moving? Open the, the chat here. No questions? All right. I don't think it's too bad. Let's go here. We're gonna add in something slightly different so we actually have a fourth step now. So, and here's kind of what we did on the board, just in a slide, right? So we can do the same thing for temperature. We can break it down by month, and if we break it down by month, temperature actually looks pretty close to a normal distribution. If we just look at the overall, uh, not as close, but month by month, for sure, we, we get these nice normal distributions, right? So I could do different months, June, February, find the different means and variances, Kind of something to notice, interesting to point out here, right? The temperature in June, a lot less variation than temperature in July or uh, temperature in February. So let's do a June example where I say, okay, on average, looking at historical data, the average temperature in June is 70.75. The variance is 6.3. What's the probability that the temperature this June is greater than 71.4? Okay. So what am I looking for here? Well, I now have this normally distributed variable of temperature. 
So X, you can kind of think about this is temperature. In June, and I have that average or that mean of 70.75. The variance was 6.3. And I wanted the probability that I saw 71.4 or greater. So now I'm looking for the area to the right, okay? So the next step is convert that cutoff value of 71.4 into a z-score, okay? So the z-score will be my cutoff value of 71.4, subtract my mean of 70.75, and divide by the standard deviation. Well, I have the variance, so I divide by the square root of 6.3. And once again, I can find this ahead of time, or I can just plug in the square root of 6.3 there. Okay. If I do that, uh, I'm forgetting what that is. So let's go, let's cheat here for a second. Uh, 0.259, right? So if I compute this in my calculator, I get 0.259, right? Now the problem is when we deal with that table, we can only ever go to the second decimal point. So instead of using 0.259, I have to use a z-score of, uh, here, I'm kind of running out of room. I'm gonna erase this real quick. So I found that z-score. I'm gonna to have to round it to the second decimal or 0.26, okay? Now when I look up that z-score on the table, remember, I'm gonna to be told the area to the left, but what I wanted was the area to the right, okay? So this is gonna tell me some probability but to find the probability I want, whatever the table tells me, I'm gonna to have to subtract it from one. Okay? Now, if I look at the original variable that I had drawn up here, anytime I look at a value above the mean, if I wanted the area to the right of it, notice it's gonna to have to be less than 0.5 because the area to the right of the mean is 0.5. Also, I know my z-score should always be positive because the z-score for that mean is always zero. So if I go to a value to the right of the mean, it's always gonna be a z-score that's positive. If I look at a value less than the mean, it's always gonna be a z-score that's negative, right? So here we found a positive z-score, so that's good, making sure we're kind of, kind of checking those things as we go. I can look up, excuse me, 0.26, so 0.26, 6 point, sorry, 0 0.6026. So this probability we just looked up was 0 0.6026. I wanted the area to the right of that value though. So one minus 0 0.6026 or 0 0.3974, okay? Any questions on, on that one? Okay with that? So kind of the last step there was once we find the, found the probability, if I want the probability that's greater than a certain cutoff, I then have to subtract it from one. So we kind of had an additional step, all right? And, all right. And if I look at the original answers, remember we said that that area has to be less than 0.5. So the only ones that really would have made sense there were A and D. Once we actually kind of Look that Z, calculate that Z score, score, look it up in the table, then subtract it from one, you find the answer is 0.3974, okay? So I'm gonna work through this one a little bit quicker. I just thought, once again, it was kind of an interesting, somewhat relevant example. Uh, I'm not gonna kind of rework the entire thing, um, but I might, might try to switch and kind of show you what, how, what would change, right? So now I'm gonna look at February temperature. I find its mean and its variance, right? Much wider variance here. In 2017, so I don't know if you guys remember, this was an unseasonably warm February. Uh, There's a couple of days where it was like 60. And so the average temperature that February was actually almost 43, right? 42.85. What was the probability that I saw an average temperature that was that high or anything higher, right? So what was the probability I saw the average temperature be 42.85 or greater? Well, we're looking for the same kind of thing as before, right? We want the area to the right of a certain cutoff score. Now, this cutoff score is greater than the mean, right? So it's gonna be the same exact setup that we had before. We're gonna find a positive Z-score, 
We're then going to take that z-score, look it up in the table. It'll give us the area to the left. We want the area to the right. So then we're going to have to subtract it from one. Okay. That really hurt actually. Um, <laughs> so all I'm doing here now is I have my cutoff value of 42.85. I can subtract the mean, divide by not 26, that's the variance, but the square root of 26. That'll spit out at me a z-score. Okay. Now if I look here, which of these can I rule out right away? I'm looking for a probability, 2.73, right? Probabilities have to be between zero and one. So right away I can rule that out. My guess is once I calculate that z-score, it's actually 2.73, right? So I plug in that cutoff value I'm interested in, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. I have this z-score now that's 2.73, okay? So just like before, right? The only thing that's changed is now instead of 0.26, I've got 2.73. I'll look this up in the table. It'll give me the area to the left. I'll then subtract it from one to get this area in the right. Now we might not be super familiar yet with this standard normal table, but I think I mentioned last Friday, being more than two standard deviations away is, is really unlikely. Here we're 2.7 standard deviations away, which means it's very, very unlikely we see something that far away from the mean. So if it's unlikely we see something that far away from the mean, this area to the right here should be relatively small. In fact, I mean, we know that because we're looking at something that's above the mean, we know it has to be less than 0.5, right? We can even say even more than that once we start recognizing that being more than two standard deviations away from the mean is very unlikely. So the area to the right there should be really close to zero. But if we look at these answers, notice the only one that's even less than 0.5 is B here. So if I gave this to you like on an online quiz, just by drawing it out and recognizing it has to be less than 0.5, you can get the right answer without even having to look it up. Right? But if we did look it up, we get that Z value of 2.73, right? And we go ahead and, okay, here's my 0.3 column. So scroll down until I get the 2.7, 2.73. The probability to the left of that is 0.9968. Remember, I wanted the area to the right, so I subtract that from one, and I get 0 0.0032. Okay. So basically what we can say there is the probability that it was as warm as it was in 2017 in February, or even warmer, that probability is 0 0.0032, or there's only a 0.32% chance that we saw it be that warm or even warmer, okay? Okay, um, where are we at in time? All right. Perfect. Any questions on that one before we kind of move into some Excel stuff? Okay. All right. So we'll use that Indiana weather data file that's up uh, under the in-class folder on uh, Canvas. There's a, a bunch of sheets here. Here's one where I was getting those histograms. Um, you can kind of tell Average monthly rainfall looks pretty close to normal distribution. Here's the one where I, I created that time series graph. But the one that I want to kind of focus on today is this temp normal. So let's go to view here. And let's change this so you guys can see a little better. All right. So um, I'm going to make this a little smaller, but I do want to have this pulled up. So I'm going to delete this for a second and kind of show you how we could, we could build this. So I'm going to delete this part, right? keep those cutoff values in. So the first thing that I want to do is let's find the mean for the average monthly temperature. So this was the annual kind of average. So I'm just going to take the average of that annual monthly or average uh, of that annual rainfall. Right? I then can find the variance, right? There dot S of that annual rainfall. Now here, I'm gonna include another row, which is the standard deviation, because when I'm using that Z-score formula, or we'll eventually see some of the other built-in formulas in Excel, it usually wants the standard deviation. So it's usually better to have that. Now, I'm just gonna take the square root, so SQRT of my variance, and that should give me my standard deviation. Excuse me. Also, another thing to point out, I use the sample here uh, because 
we don't have every single year of data, so I'm treating this as a, as a sample, right? I have a lot of, but not, not everyone. Now I could also do this by, by month, so I could do Junes. So find the average temperature in June. So scroll over, here's June. So control shift on a Mac command shift, hit the down arrow. Now, one thing to be careful of here, this is something I did bad that I wanna point out. If I use that shortcut, notice I have this extra row here that isn't part of the data set. So when I hit control shift, I'm actually just gonna hold shift now and go up. And now I can just go up by one cell and make sure I only select kind of the data, right? Same kind of idea, use that var.s, select that variable, make sure that I hold shift, go up one, and don't include this additional information which is not part of the data set, okay? So I've got my, my average, my variance there. Now what I'll do, probably an easier way instead of doing that, this is bad practice. This is me being lazy. So um, I'm gonna insert, right? So if I just right click here and insert, it'll put in an additional row. Now, when I go up here and try to do those like average form, uh, you know, average of that variable. Now, when I use my shortcut, control shift down arrow, now it stops the first blank file. So in practice, don't ever put anything directly below the data. Make sure there's at least a row in between, okay? And I'll be better about that as well. Um, find the standard deviation. We can take the square root of our variance. And now here I'm going to do something as well. I don't know why I, I wanted you to skip August, but I'm going to make a little life a little bit easier. Let's right click on this column U and go to insert. And let's just add in August here as well. Right? Because now I can use that average, the variance and the standard deviations I had. And when I copy them over, well, they'll just start using the next kind of average of July. Oh, did I not hit the first one? I must have had this bad. So this actually should start. You know, let's try this again. I want to take the average of not July, all of June, right? Did I have the variance right? Yeah, the variance one started in the correct cell. Sorry about that. Copy that over. Okay. So hopefully you selected it correctly and I, I was I was off by a cell, right? So now we've got the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation for each one of these months. What I can do is use Excel instead of using that table and looking things up. So the first thing I can do is find the z-score. So if we recall, kind of the equation I have for that z-score was just take the cutoff value I'm interested in, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. So I'm basically just going to put that formula in Excel. So take the cutoff value here. This is the X value I'm interested in. Subtract the mean for that month's temperature and divide by the standard deviation for that month's temperature. Right? So this will find me that, that Z score. I could copy this over if I wanted to. And actually I should, uh, move this over and include August since I now did that. Choose some cutoff for August, maybe 80 that we're interested in. Copy this over. So notice now this one, oh, why does it not do that? Why did it not like that? Oh, cause I can move this here. Now we should be, there we go. Yeah. So after you insert that thing for August, then you can copy over that Z-score formula. Yeah. So we now have our z-scores for these different cutoff values for the different months, all right? I can then use the norm.s.dist function. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell Excel, hey, I'm gonna tell you a z-score. I want you to tell me the area to the left of it or the probability I see that z-score or anything below it. Well, that's exactly what the standard normal table does. So select your z-score, comma. Now the second thing we'll always tell this function is a one. That's telling it, make it cumulative. Look up that z-score and tell me the probability of that z-score and anything below it. Why they have the option for zero in there, it, not gonna be anything that pertains to this class. So whenever we're using these dist functions, you should always have a one there for that last argument or that last thing the, the function wants, which is to make it cumulative. 
okay? We could then copy that over. Now we have that for all of our months. And now, you know, here we did the intermediate step of finding a z-score. Kind of a nicer shortcut is if we use the norm.dist function, Excel will do everything for us. It'll calculate the z-score, it'll then look up that z-score and then return to you the probability. So it's still gonna find the same probability, it just cuts out this intermediate step. So we have the same cutoff, here's June's mean, comma, June's standard deviation, comma, similar to the norm.s.dist, it wants this cumulative, which will always put a one in here, all right? So this function says, okay, take this cutoff value, take the mean, take the standard deviation, calculate the z-score behind the scenes, then look up that z-score in the table and tell me the probability of seeing that z-score or anything below it. So if we do that, we should be getting the exact same values here. Just kind of cut out some additional work, all right? Now, what if, I mean, I could, you know, to kind of show you, I chose different cutoffs here, but let's say, what's a good value to do here? All right, let's do, let's do 72. Okay. Let's use 72 for all of them for a second. So what's the probability that in June, we see an average temperature of 72 or lower? Well, that value is slightly above the mean. So we know that probability should be greater than 0.5. Sure enough, it is, all right? Well, if we look at July, what's the probability that in July we see a temperature of 72 or below? Well, now it's below the average July temperature, right? And also, you know, so now it's to the left of the mean. We should have a negative Z value. And the area to the left of it should be something less than 0.5, which it is. And it kind of intuitively makes sense, right? July is typically warmer than June. So it should be much less likely for us to see that same average temperature in, Jul in, in July than in June. Right? And if we go to August, August it starts to, the average temperature starts to fall a little bit. So that probably becomes a little bit more likely we see 72 or below. Then in September, well, the average temperature is usually 66. So the probability that we see something at 72 or below is very, very likely, right? This is way to the right of our mean, right? 72 is way to the right of the mean to the area to the left should be pretty close to one, which sure enough, right, 0.97 or about 0.98, okay? But you know, you could play around, you know, what's the probability it's 80 or less and in August, you could play around these cutoff values. Now, another thing that I might be interested in is something that we were doing in the examples is what's the probability that it's this warm or greater, right, or more? So the probability that X is greater than X, how could I find this with what I already have? Well, if this is giving me the area to the left, all I have to do is subtract that from one, right? And now I can kind of find the mirror, right? The other side of that cutoff value, the area to the right, of that cutoff value, okay? Huh? The other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other side of that Z value or whatever the X value was we were using. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this before I go over a couple more things. Let's double check the chat. Good. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to do here, um, it just mentioned to you if you're looking at this, we can do uh, similar things in using um, the rain data set I have here. I will, get this updated. I was trying to, I was doing this quicker. So I did some things where I froze cells, only the columns, not the rows. I'll get this file updated so that that's not in there. So it doesn't confuse you. You would set it up exactly the same way we did temperature over here. Um, and then we could play around with different, different cutoff scores for, for inches of rainfall as well. Okay. So just another example of what, what we worked through here in class today. Uh, one other thing I thought was kind of interesting that I put in here is you could actually build your own contingency table. Not that I'm gonna expect any of you to do it or that you have any interest in doing it since I've already provided one for you. But let's think about it. If we have this contingency table, how could I find, let's say this very first cell down here. If I took negative 3.90 and I put that into my norm.s.dist function, 
I'm telling it the z-score of negative 3.9, it would give me the area to the left, which is exactly what I want in this table. If I took negative 2.54 and I told Excel norm.s.dist negative 2.54, it should return to me that probability of 0 0.0055. And I could continue to do this for every single cell, right? So every one of these cells really represents a norm.s.dist function where I'm adding up the column and the row heading, okay? Now, it's a little bit more complicated. I set it up with the row headings, the column headings. It's a little bit more complicated because down here, to get negative 3.71, I can't add 0.01. I actually want to subtract it, right, to make it a larger negative value. So I had some if statements and stuff in there. But essentially, what this is doing is in every cell, it's using a norm.s.dist function where it's adding the row and the column heading. So they go negative 0.371, negative 0.372 plug that into the normal distribution function and it's giving me the probability. So we can make sure that's working. At zero, we get the probability of 0.5, which is what it should be. Notice if we go to negative 0 0.40, we get 3, 0.34457. So if I go to the table, negative 0 0.4, 0 0.3446. So it's close, right? Uh, it's a little off, but it's because it's rounded to the third decimal, right? Or third decimal, fourth decimal, right? So Excel can actually give me the, the very precise value, right? I don't have to kind of round things to the fourth decimal in here. So this is even like a more accurate standard normal distribution table than, than what you have here because they have to round the probabilities to the fourth decimal. Right? Um, and I'll never expect you to like do a if statement this complicated and I froze some of the, you know, I froze the columns, but not the row headings. Anytime we freeze cells, we're just freezing everything. Like I'm never having examples where we have to do that. But it is kind of interesting to show like you could actually kind of reproduce this and, and uh, create this in Excel, right? Oh, this is off a little bit. This should be, I had a slight, slight error there. Shouldn't have made too much difference, but just to make sure that I'm getting, right. there we go, okay? Any questions kind of over anything in Excel? Like what you'll have to do is gonna look something more similar to this, right? For that Excel assignment that I'll, I'll uh, post on Wednesday, okay? After we do a little bit more work in Excel, all right? So I think we're gonna hold off there because um, the other section we took a little more time. Um, we didn't get to the inverse. We'll start talking about this inverse transformation and doing a little more work in Excel on Wednesday. And then we'll start talking about um, sampling, okay? So if there's no more questions for me, I'll let you guys get out of here a little bit early today. You good? All right.